All right. You can turn in your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 4, which is where we're going to spend uh, all of our time today. And uh, if, you, if you haven't been with us here at um, the Oasis Sunday morning um, gatherings, what we've been doing during this time uh, where, we, where we teach the Bible in the last few weeks is we've, uh, we've actually looked at um, the Old Testament. And we're going to be doing that for uh, several weeks now. I don't know how long, but um, it might be kind of cool to, um, to stay in this even through the Christmas season as we get closer to some of the, some of the prophetic stories that, that point to the coming of Christ. But um, really every story in the Old Testament um, does in some way uh, point to Jesus because it's all about um, God's progressive plan for redemption uh, of his people. And that's one of the things that we talked about last week is we didn't, we didn't um, zero in on any one story in particular last week, but what we did was a, a sort of a survey or an overview of the Old Testament and how the Old Testament fits together in our Bible how the Old Testament creates the background and, and the foreshadowing of what's to come in the New Testament. And so I'm not gonna go back over that again, but if you'd like to, to listen to that as sort of a, um, you know, just sort of a, a, a precursory to what we're gonna get into today and what we're gonna get into in the coming weeks, uh, then that would be great. Now, what are we going, how are we gonna do the Old Testament? How are we gonna study the Old Testament? We're gonna start at the beginning and basically hit every verse uh, from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, all the way through, all the way through the Old Testament, or are we going to um, pick out some stories? Or are we gonna play the old game of Bible roulette where we just flip through and say, okay, that one, and then, and then preach that from the Old Testament? Um, really, none of those are what we're gonna do. What, what, what I decided to do was, um, I, I, well, I kind of, I guess I kind of did that last one. I did, although it wasn't roulette, it was just, it was just prayer. It is, it's, it's okay, God. What, um, as, as you, as you think, th as I think through the account, the accounts and the events that have taken place from the beginning, from the beginning of time as we know it, the, the, the creation, Genesis chapter one, verse one, all the way to the end of the Old Testament, which is, brings us to that 400 years of silence that um, ends uh, from the prophet Malachi before we get into Matthew. What, what stories in this timeline do you want me to hit? And, uh, and so what we're going to do is we're not going to talk about all the stories. We're not going to tell all the Old Testament stories. We're not going to, um, to, to, to feel like we have to start in a particular book and then preach that entire book. We're, I, I, I'm just sitting down with, with Bible in hand um, and just saying, Lord, show me a, a story here that... that kind of sticks out above some of the others. And, and as I flipped through, beginning at Genesis chapter 1, um, chapter 4 and the story of Cain and Abel was the first story that caught my attention. I thought that we would begin in Deuteronomy, um, but there's so much that took place before Moses gave the law and before Moses described uh, the way the, the, the tabernacle was to be built and the, before he described the ways that, that ceremonies were to take place. There's so much that has happened before that. And so we at least need to look at a few of those stories. Well, when God created the heavens and the earth and everything in the earth and he created man and he created woman from man, though that first family, that first marriage of husband and wife, they had children. And that's where we're going to pick up here uh, today. Now, this is after the, the fall. This is after their deception of, of, of eating from the forbidden uh, tree that God said you are not to eat from. You can eat of any tree in this garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they were tempted by the serpent. The, 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 the angel Lucifer who had fallen from heaven, as we know from the book of Isaiah, gives us a little more detail of where he came from. And they made the decision, the choice to disobey God. And in doing so, they bring sin into the world. They bring this curse into the world um, because of their sin that every single one of us now have to live in and under. And so we're going to see a little bit about how that affected the world right from the start, right from the very first children that Adam and Eve conceived. So let's read here in, in Genesis chapter 4. We'll read the first 16 verses. And our time together today will be centered around this particular event that took place a long time ago. Now Adam knew, his, uh, knew Eve, his wife. When it says knew there um, in the Bible, in the Hebrew text, and even a couple places in the Greek text, 
That word new is, is, is to be intimate in every, every possible way. Paul uses that when he talks about the same exact word, actually, when he talks about how I long to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. It's a very emphatic no. What in here, it's a very sexual term as well. He knew his wife. That means they conceived a child together. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? And the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Why don't we pray together before we talk about this story? Lord, again, we come to you this morning just as we did a week ago this time and as we do every, t- every week during this time. And, and our desire is to, in some way, hear from you, to hear your voice. And I know sometimes it's, it's difficult to discern your voice and what you're saying when it's always my voice that's being heard. And so my prayer this morning is that, that you would simply use me as a conduit for water as it flows into our cups as we get drinks out of the sink. We don't see that conduit. We don't know what's going on underneath there and underneath the ground and where the water comes from, but we, we love the water. It tastes good. It's refreshing, and it nourishes our bodies. And I pray that this morning that as these words come from my mouth, it will not be my voice or my understanding of them that the people in the room here um, discern, but it would be your Holy Spirit. And so what I'm praying for, Lord, is that your Holy Spirit would come. I know that you're here. We know that you're together with us as we, as we sing this morning. The, 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 um, the, the excitement and the, the, the passion that was flowing in this room out of the hearts of the people and their voices was so evident. And my prayer is that we be very sensitive to your spirit today, that you would speak to us through this old, old story that shows us an example of your love and your grace. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this is a story. Um, if you think about it, it's the story of the f- about the first dysfunctional family. Um, some of you have come from families that have had extremely difficult times, and, um, and uh, this is where it began. This is, the first, this, this is the first murder ever recorded in time that we know of, the first murder. And, and, and you know, traditional commentators um, have a tendency to race through the story. It's really, sometimes it's kind of hard to find depth of commentary and, and study um, about this story because everybody wants to race through this story and, and looking for, you know, for Jesus to defend God here. 
Because there are some really troubling things that God decides to do or not do um, in this story. And so what happens is that, that we, we immediately go to Jesus. And if you think about it this way, and I, and I spent a little time studying some Jewish theologians and Jewish authors when I did this story uh, preparation this week, because the original readers before Christ didn't have the luxury that we have of thinking about the grace of Christ that is to come. They actually had to wrestle with these stories in the Old Testament. I remember one of the Jewish theologians says, I don't have the advantage of reading Jesus into my Bible, so I have to grapple with the God of the Hebrew Scriptures. And I think we should too. I think we should do that a little bit, at least as much as we can, without totally forgetting that the promises of the New Testament are present in the Old Testament, and that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the same God of the New Testament. There is nothing different about this God. He is the same. When we read some of these ancient stories in the Old Testament, uh, the way we read them, we should read them in a way where we want to get to know the person that you're reading about. And, and, and if God is the hero of, of all of these stories, if, 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 if Christ really is the hero, Christ the creator is the hero, then what we want to do is get to know him better. And when we want to get to know someone, a person, a personality, we don't just read theology books that tell us about their character. What we do is you observe their character. You, you observe their behavior with other people and how they made decisions and the kinds of, you listen to stories and things that they have done in the past, the ways that they treated people and the ways that they reacted in different situations. And that's one of the big ways that we get to know all of the characters in the Old Testament. If you really want to get to know Moses, then, then that's what you do. You kind of have to put yourself in the story and walk with the people that were behind Moses in the wilderness. And, and you have to kind of think about what it was like, what he was dealing with when he said what he said. Well, if we're doing that with all the other Bible characters, then we ought to do that with God as well. Listening you know, to the stories that people have told about God over centuries and observing how he behaved in relationships with people over the course of time. This story has a couple of main characters. You see God and Cain having conversation in the majority of this story. And there's some really peculiar behavior here. In this particular story, what we, what we observe is, in many ways, very troubling behavior. It, you know, we need to face that. We need to face the fact that God is complicated, that this is, this is a complicated thing to think about before we rush into some happy ending in the New Testament, which we know is there. We need to pause for a moment and think about what they read in those first days, in those first before Christ came, in that 400 years of silence. How did they portray what God had done in these stories? And that's what we're going to do. Here in Genesis 4, we have what looks like and what's been described as by, by some theologians and by some commentators, a, a capricious God or a fickle God who apparently makes an arbitrary choice between the offerings of two brothers. These two brothers bring an offering of worship, or at least that's what it looks like to Cain. I guess we could say that. I mean, Cain feels that way, and many commentators feel that way. This is just an arbitrary choice. God liked one but not the other. And you also see a God who stands by silently while an innocent man is, for all we know, bludgeoned to death by the hands of his brother. And we have a God who refuses to do justice, who refuses to kill Cain just as Cain killed Abel. And none of this makes any sense to us, except for the fact that it rings really true to what we see of God in ourselves, in our own lives. We live in a world where the Abels, who do everything right, still suffer at the hands of others, where it seems like God may still be making arbitrary choices. Do we not? Do you not feel that way sometimes? where God stands silently by while throughout history, think about it, Jews were slaughtered, Africans starve. Today, while women are raped and children are abused, 
Sometimes you wonder, where is he? What's he doing? Where God doesn't swoop down and punish the ones that are responsible for these great atrocities that we have in our world all around us all the time. And Genesis, the whole book of Genesis, rings true with what it means to be a human being living in this world. I mean, all the stories in this book, I mean, if you, if, if you, if you really look at this from story to story to story, there is, there is sin, there is evil. If you turn the stories of Genesis into a graphic novel or a movie, it would require an NC-17 rating. These stories are not pretty, and they are certainly not G-rated, but they ring true even to our experience today, here, and now. And like so many stories in the Bible, this one here in Genesis chapter 4 is about two brothers. I mean, you, always, you often see brothers involved in these stories early on in the Bible. And, and the older, whose name is Cain, and, uh, which his name means to create. That's what Cain's, all these names were, that uh, had meaning in the Hebrew world, and they, they were very important. And it's interesting that the younger's name, Abel, um, it, it can be translated vapor or nothingness. And in a culture where names meant something, this is a little difficult to explain, that Cain's name means to create and Abel's just means vapor or nothingness. The older sons never seem to have much luck in the Bible stories, but in this one, it's the younger son that gets the raw end of the deal. Um, no one noticed, I mean, think about Abel's name, vapor. Who's going to hear his cries for help? Who's going to notice if he's gone? Right? Well, this fan, what, what, is there more going on here than we realize? You know, we, even in this story where Abel is thought of as the good guy, right? If you've ever been taught Cain and Abel, about Cain and Abel, you tend to think Abel is the good guy. Well, the good guy never gets a speaking part in this story. Abel, you don't hear Abel saying anything. I mean, Abel's just a shadow in this story. I mean, clearly the story is not about Abel, or it's not about why we should try to be the good guy. Cain, the oldest brother, the older brother of these two, he grows up to be a farmer, and he farms the land. And we know that um, the story tells us that he, um, he has crops, and Abel is a rancher. Both are very good professions, not anything wrong with either of those professions. But somewhere along the way, you know, somebody decides, they get this idea to bring an offering or a sacrifice to the God who had kicked their parents out of the garden because of their sin. And this, too, is a little hard to explain if you, if you, if you think about it. It's, it's, kind of the, it's one of the first acts of worship or one of the first offerings that's brought um, that we see in the Bible. Um, but why would they do this? Whose idea was it? Um, many theologians believe that they were doing this because God had undoubtedly revealed it to them. And, and, and you know, some question, well, how were Cain and Abel supposed to know what to sacrifice? Um, why on earth, if you think about the, the way the story went down, why is, this, why is this the first domestic dispute? I mean, th th what are they doing? They're worshiping, right? I mean, the first horrific person-on-person -person crime in the Bible is ignited by something religious, <laughs> something that happens when two brothers come together to worship. <laughs> why does this thing just keep happening? Over and over and over, every generation after generation, the same thing keeps happening. The same conflicts continue. We, I, we don't always know all the answers to these stories. We can't read between all the lines. We don't know whatever their motivation was. Both brothers brought offerings to the Lord, and the Lord looks with favor on Abel's offering, but not on Cain's offering. Growing up, I learned that this, this must have meant that God rejected Cain's offering. There are some actual translators that use the word reject. He rejected Cain's offering, but, but he accepted Abel's. And I don't think that the text really says rejected. It doesn't say that in mine. It didn't say that in the ESV. It said that he had regard for Abel's offering and did not have regard for Cain's offering. That simply means, in my mind, that he preferred one over the other. You know, and, and some scholars will argue there's lots of different reasons why we see uh, God behaving in the way that he does, and, and there are lots of different ex explanations. Some scholars will argue that there was no reason for God to prefer Abel's offering. 
I mean, that God's preference or God's choice, you could say, was just completely arbitrary and mysterious and that he's the one, because of his choice, that in essence caused this whole argument between the brothers in the first place by playing favorites. Now, although God certainly has the right to make arbitrary choices if he wants, Um, I'm not so sure that's what's happening in this case. And I know that those theologians are certainly a lot more learned than I am, and I I, I don't, but I'm just not willing to write off this as completely, just a complete and utter arbitrary act of God. And I think the text itself possibly does give us a reason, a reason why God chose Abel's offering or regarded his more than Cain's. And the answer to the question about how Cain and Abel even knew to bring an offering or a sacrifice at all is that, in my mind, I think God must have instructed them and that the offering that they were to bring was to be some sort of substitutionary atonement. That Because you read, if you, if you remember in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, it says, it talks about Cain and Abel. And when in that faith chapter, by faith, so-and-so did this, by faith, so-and-so did this. Well, it says early on in that chapter that by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. And when, so when Abel came for worship, according to the Hebrew writer, that he came by faith. He brought an offering by faith, the offering of the fat portions from, from some of the firstborn of his flock, it says in Genesis 4.4. And so the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, and it was accepted more so than Cain's. To think about it this way, Cain uh, brought garden variety produce from his garden. That's what Cain brought. And Abel brought the fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. And so perhaps, perhaps, God preferred the offering that actually cost something. That God appreciated the first fruits more than the leftovers. Now, the fact that there may have been a reason, I think, is probably more important to our understanding of God than those early on, especially Cain, because it made no difference at all to Cain, did it? I think, you know, and I, and I think we could probably understand the way Cain felt as well. I mean, if you put yourself in the story, Cain felt a little shunned here. I mean, I, when I was a child, I mean, you know, when, you're, when you go to a birthday party as a kid, as a, as a, put yourself in, in a little child's shoes here for a minute. And in your mind, go, you're going to a birthday party and you bring a gift to the birthday boy. You want the birthday boy to be, you know, to, when he opens up your gift, to be really impressed and like your gift. Oh, it didn't, didn't cost you anything. Your parents bought it, right? But it still hurts to have your gift tossed aside once it's been opened while the birthday boy runs off to play with somebody else's gift. Doesn't it? Just, just a little bit. Now, multiply that sense of disappointment by a thousand times or so when it comes to giving a gift that you made yourself and you bring it to your parents and they reject it. Or they just kind of don't regard it. Don't say anything about it. And even more when it's a gift for God. And that's what Cain did. So Cain is upset here, right? He's, he's hurt. He's jealous. And really, he's just downright angry. He's, he's mad. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast, he asks him, right? And, and here comes sort of the most, you know, one of the most controversial, maybe even one of the most hard to interpret uh, parts of this passage, maybe, and perhaps even maybe the most important verse in this whole chapter. Verse 7, in verse 7, God says, sort of, he sort of says, get a grip on yourself, right? <laughs> Cain, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? I mean, God has Cain, who's angry about his offering, and God says, hey, listen, you get another opportunity. 
J Jewish oral tradition has God speaking to Cain here, this is very interesting, in a soft voice, inviting him to try again, letting him know that God's favor is absolutely widespread that it is within Cain's ability to bring a right offering, that God gives Cain a second chance. But Cain doesn't want one, does he? And the Lord goes on to assure Cain that it is possible. If, if, you, don't, I mean, if you do right, will, will you not be accepted as well? It is possible for you to do right, but it's not going to be easy. And the reason why it's not going to be easy is because sin is creeping into his life little by little. And sin strongly desires to overtake him. This sounds a whole lot like Peter who writes in the New Testament that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion just waiting to pounce on any one of us. And here in Genesis, this same personification is taking place about sin being like an animal force that really desperately wants to do us in. And the word here, desire, that is used in Genesis is the same word that God uses earlier in Genesis chapter 3 when he announces to Adam and Eve the consequences for their disobedience. He told Eve that her pain would be increased in childbearing, but her desire would be for her husband. That's the kind of passionate and overwhelming desire that this sin creature has for Cain. It's like sin is, a, is, is, is sort of a creature, isn't it, or a beast that wants to, to overtake Cain and wants to overtake a person. God warns Cain that this sin lusts after him with animal passion, with a hunger, that sin desires to overtake him. And then God also tells him something that he tells, tells to Eve back in Genesis 3 when she says that her husband would be her master. But here in this story, in chapter 4, he tells Cain that he must be the master, that he must be the master over the sin that's desiring to overtake him. And yes, this is the same Hebrew word that was used in that chapter earlier, which is kind of interesting. But even more important is that the word for master or uh, you must rule over it, rule in, in the ESV, it says rule over it. In other translations, I think that, is it the New American Standard that says master? I thought it was. Master over it, you must rule over it. It's the same word in both, in both places. But the, the thing about it here in, in chapter 4 is that we don't know exactly what, what it's a little ambiguous, what, what master or rule really means here. I mean, what, what I mean is this. It might mean that Cain must master the sin beast, right? The sin creature. He must. He must do it. Or it might mean that Cain should master the sin beast. And it might mean that he can master it. It could mean any of those. I mean, it could mean... But any one of those meanings, in any, any of those, the point is the same. And the point is possible. It's possible. You don't have to be mastered by sin, God is telling Cain. You might think that you are, and it might be very, very difficult sometimes, and it might be knocking at your door, and it might be pouncing on you like a roaring lion, but you still have the power to master, to rule over sin. Cain does not have to give in to sin. And the other intriguing word in verse 7 is the word translated as sin. Sin is crouching at the door. It, and it, it's interesting because in the Hebrew, it's just a one letter, uh, it's one letter off from the name of a well-known Mesopotamian demon who crouches in doorways waiting to attack. And this is a demon that the ancient readers would have been very familiar with. And God is speaking here in a language that ancient people would clearly understand as he's using these metaphors. But Cain, at this point in the story, he's too hurt. He's, it's, it's like he's allowed himself to just go over the line. He's, he's, he's envious, he's angry, and he doesn't want to pay any attention to anything that God has to say. And it doesn't matter to him um, one bit if there was a reason that God had preferred Abel's offering over his. He looks at Abel and he thinks, it's your fault, Abel. If you didn't exist, then God would love me. 
if you, you know, you're the, you're the obstacle between God and me, and it's your fault. And so Cain's rage and his sense of rejection by God are, are really, really strong, and he just chooses not to fight against his own desire for revenge. And this sin creature that was crouching at his door now springs at him like a lion, and Cain is consumed with his sin. And so in his angry passion, he lures Abel out into a field, and he attacks him and kills him. And that's the first murder, the first death that we see in the Bible. And it makes you wonder, it makes me wonder if Cain really knew what he was doing. I mean, he'd, he'd never seen anyone die before. Did he know that he was capable of snuffing out somebody's life, his brother Abel? I remember when I was a really young boy, um, I, I don't know, probably 10 years old, 11 years old or so. I guess not that young, but kind of young. First time I ever shot a BB gun. A friend of mine, Rodney, brings his BB gun over to our house. and uh, I'm like, oh, there's a, there's a bird, a robin, right? Some of the best birds out there, robins. And I got that bird in the sight, and y'all are going to hate me after the story, but I got the bird right in the sight, and uh, I pulled the trigger thinking, I can't shoot. It's my first time I ever shot. And I watched the bird drop to the ground, and it was immediate. It was immediate. I wanted to throw up. I'd never killed anything before. That bird didn't do anything to me, right? It's innocent. It just happened to be there. And I shot and killed it for no reason at all. And it made me sick to my stomach. Is that what happened to Cain? Was he surprised of the fact that his brother was no longer, I mean, was he horrified? Was he even, I mean, was he sorry? Was he even sorry? And, and, and even more, where was God? <laughs> well, I mean, while this was happening to innocent Abel, where was God? Why, where did doing the right thing get Abel? Think about this story, right? I mean, when push comes to shove, the good guy here was left abandoned. He was unprotected by God. I mean, if this is what it means to be the favored one, then maybe it's better to be the unfavored one. I mean, at least Cain is still alive in verse 8. Abel's been erased. He's become exactly what his, his name means, a vapor, nothingness. He's gone. And then God shows up afterwards, and he asks Cain, where is your brother? God knows where his brother is, but he asks, just like he asked, just like he asked you know, Adam and Eve in the garden. He knows where they're trying to hide. But Cain responds, and he responds with a question that's resonated from generation to generation, still lives on today. Maybe some of you have even used this, right? I don't am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, Cain, as a matter of fact, you are. And we all are. We are. Now, of course, God knows perfectly well where Cain or you know where Abel is, and and the Bible tells us that he had heard Abel's blood crying out from the ground for vindication or vengeance. Right, and this is the same word that's used throughout the Old Testament for whenever the oppressed will cry out to God for help. Frederick uh, Buchner says that Abel's blood cries out with the sound of a wounded animal. And Cain just can't keep his dead brother to keep quiet, to keep still. It's just there's no way for his sin to, be, uh, to hide from, from God. God's going to find him out, and God is angry. And his response is unusual in the sense that he decides to not kill Cain, but to send him away to the land of Nod. Cain gets a, a life sentence, not a death sentence. And it doesn't seem fair. It, it doesn't seem just. I mean, nobody should get away with murder, right? In 2011, um, a convicted murderer was executed in a federal prison in the state of Georgia by lethal injection. And justice was done. And this story made several headlines because it was videotaped. And it was the first time an execution by lethal injection had ever been video recorded. Um, and the, the, the purpose of that, according to the governor, was that they would hope that it would um, 
minimize or cause some to be frightened to not commit the kinds of murders that would require such just punishment. Well, what happened was in 1993, the prisoner whose name was Andrew DeYoung, uh, maybe some of you remember um, the story, he was 19 years old and he entered his family's home in the middle of the night and, and he stabbed his mother, Catherine, while she was sleeping. And um, of course, her husband, Gary, uh, wakes up because of her screams and he struggles with Andrew, but he's also killed. And Sarah, his 14-year-old sister, heard the commotion and she came out of her room and went down the hallway to see what was going on and Andy proceeded to stab her to death in the hallway outside of her parents' bedroom. Well, his 16-year-old brother Nathan um, escaped through a window and came back later with a neighbor just as Andy was leaving the house. He also had an accomplice with him, Andy did. He was supposed to, um, the accomplice was supposed to go in and take care of the brother, but um, that's when the brother escaped. Nathan was the one to identify Andy as the murderer at his trial. Well, according to the prosecution, um, DeYoung had killed his family in order to collect an inheritance from their estate, um, which was estimated to be worth approximately $480,000. And after this incident, there were hundreds of news reports and blogs and online forums, many of which you can still find today. I looked up last night and looked at some of them and their comments that are still being made underneath um, some of these articles that have been written about this story. And most of those comments were followed by total strangers who, you know, most, most of them arguing for or against the death penalty. And many of them actually had no knowledge or little knowledge at all of the events that actually took place. One example of this is a comment that was made by a person who said that he was sure that if you ask the victim's families, if you ask the victim's family what they think of capital punishment, that they would say that Andy deserved to die and that they're glad to see him dead. Well, the problem is, in this case, the family of the victim is also the family of the murderer. I read, read one of the particular article where um, there was an interview of one of the family members, um, an uncle of Andy DeYoung. And in that interview, the uncle emphatically stated that no one in their family wanted Andy to be executed. Now think about it this. Now after, after everything that, that, that took place, after the horrific events that this kid, this man decided to, 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 you know, to, to complete, killing family members, other family members that were still alive were saying, we don't want him to be executed. And in fact, at, at his sentencing, Andy's grandparents pleaded with the prosecutor and the judge for a life sentence rather than a death sentence. And the reason was so that Andy would have all the time that he needed to be made right with God. That was their reason. And also so that they, the family, would have all the time that they need to forgive him. Forgive him for killing their, their daughter, their son-in-law and their granddaughter. And so they did not want to see him dead. Now let's come back to this story in Genesis 4. Because it brings up a similar question, I think. Why didn't God kill Cain for killing Abel? Why didn't God choose justice? Because God is just, right? We know that God is perfectly just. That is one of his characteristics. It's one of his attributes that we love about God. God is just. So why didn't he kill Cain? Because that would be the just thing to do. Maybe. Because God loved Cain too. And as Cornelius Plantinga says in his book, a theologian at Calvin Seminary says in his book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, a Breviary of Sin, he says this, love really messes with justice. I don't think any one of us want to live in a world where justice is always triumphant over mercy. I know I don't. 
Because if, if we have any sense of self-awareness at all, we know that a piece of Cain lives in each one of us. That we, we, have, we have a little bit of Cain in us. We like to believe that rationality and morality and, and commitment to God are a lot stronger than evil. But the fact is that passion, passion is enormously strong. Jealousy is enormously strong. And so rationality and morality in the face of passion and violence are actually rather weak. And so the temptation to give in to this beast that sin is, is so, so great. And the ability to give in to, to the sin that's inside each of us is so great. And each of us needs to confront our own ability to do great evil all the time because this same sin is lying in wait at the doorstep just as it was in the story that we studied here today. It's called original sin. The same sin that God is talking about with Cain is the one that is lurking at you as well. We're all capable, though we might admit it or not admit it, we're all capable of giving in to our most murderous rages and our most passionate jealousies. And the good news is that even here in this story, we see the good news about the alternative to this. And that is, we don't have to. That's awesome. It's right here in the first story of, of sin, you know, the second story of sin in our Bibles. It says we can do right. God tells Cain, you can do right. You can please God. But it's never going to be easy. And it's never going to be naturally your first instinct. Theologian uh, Walter Brugman describes sin and evil as an animal yearning for destructiveness that will destroy both the victim and the perpetrator. And he says Freud may have gone on, uh, first named it id, but he was not the first to recognize it. Genesis' metaphor of the ambushing animal reminds us that any one of us may be torn apart by that raw animal power at any moment. Now, of course, God knows this. He knows how difficult obedience is. He knows that. And so from the beginning of time, time as we know it, we see God with, with justice in his left hand and mercy in his right hand. And God is perfect in both. And in Genesis chapter 4, he doesn't do what is just, does he? He doesn't take Cain's life as a punishment for Abel's life. Now, he punishes Cain, but he doesn't kill Cain. But for Cain, if we think about the rest of the story, for Cain, the punishment may have actually been worse for, than death. I mean, to him, he, you know, why? Because, well, he's a farmer, and now it tells us that the ground has become absorbed with his brother's blood. The same ground that's become absorbed with his brother's blood is not going to produce for him. And so he's, he's sent away. He's, got, he's, 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 he's now rootless. He has no family, no He's homeless. He's abandoned. He's alone. And he doesn't want to go to the land of Nod because God won't be there. Right now, he's with God. They're with God. And, 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 and isn't it interesting that <laughs> Cain doesn't want to obey God, but he doesn't want to lose God either. You find that interesting? Oh, I don't want to obey you, God, but I sure need you around in case I need you. Right? And now the murderer is himself afraid of being murdered. He was, he was scared that someone's going to kill him. And so as we will see throughout history and all of the stories in the Bible, you will see that God extends grace and mercy to Cain. And it says that he puts a, a, his mark on Cain so that anyone who meets him, no one who meets him will lay a hand on him to kill him. It's a mark that proclaims you know, a couple of things, if you think about it, it proclaims his guilt and God's grace. It proclaims both. It's in a real, it's, it's a real, it's, and it's sort of ambivalent. We, you know, no one can touch him, but everyone sure knows he's a criminal. It's kind of a paradoxical mark, isn't it? No one can touch you or kill you, but that mark shows us that you're a criminal. It doesn't signify anything, um, or it doesn't signify or guarantee um, 
Cain's resurrection or his homecoming in heaven, that's actually going to have to wait until Jesus Christ makes a way for Cain, just as he does for us. But that mark gives Cain time for reconciliation. And that mark protects Cain from those who are out to destroy him. And we have no idea what that mark actually looked like. I think the best that we can do to understand what the point of that mark is, is to compare it to the water that goes over our heads at baptism when we go under the water. That in the New Testament, as Christians decide, as Christians are, are regenerated by the, the, the Holy Spirit of Christ, and your heart decides to cry out that for in need of Christ, and you put your faith in Christ, and you decide, I want, to, I want to show the world what Christ has done, then the Bible speaks of being obedient in baptism, and this baptism is a water that comes over your head, and that baptism does the same thing that it did for Cain. It marks both your guilt, your admission, that you're a sinner, and it marks grace, that you are forgiven, and you are now in the hands of God, that you're protected by God. And this story articulates in such a real way, I think, the, the, the double-sidedness of the Christian life, right? We're, we're, in, we're in jeopardy all the time for disobedience, and yet we're kept safe. The, the, the acknowledgement of guilt and the reality of grace, they come together in this story when God does not let go of the guilty and unreconciled one, Cain. The God who calls this world into being, who created the world, just a short time before this story happened, at the very beginning, he does not stop calling not even to this guilty brother. And he's such a mysterious God. I mean, the mystery of God is that, is that God's protection somehow now extends to Cain even over into this land of Nod, to the place beyond his protection, to the place somehow beyond humanness, and, and, and you know, but that God's face somehow is still on that brother even though he's been banished from his home, even though he's been banished from others. And now all Christians, you and me, if you're a Christian here today, have experienced the same kind of thing. We've all experienced grace and mercy. But perhaps for many of us, the experience may have lacked the, the intensity of being caught red-handed, right? In the middle of something, standing face to face with God, exposed with our brother's blood dripping from our hands, just as Cain was standing there. And so perhaps it's especially those who are hunted fugitives, I guess you could say, like Cain, that are able to join in Paul's words in Romans, singing perhaps the top of your lungs, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Cain's the first one, perhaps. I hope he got it. I hope he realized it. The first one to be able to sing of God's grace in that way. But even with this grace-filled ending, it's a difficult story. And I know that I've left some questions unanswered, and that's because I have no answer for some of the questions that arise from these kinds of stories, from these kinds of accounts. And that's the way it's going to be. Most of the stories in the Old Testament are going to be difficult. They're going to be hard to understand. So if you're hoping to get every answer um, before we leave the, the room every Sunday, it's just not going to happen. It's going to, be, it's going to be difficult, hard to interpret, hard to accept at times the, the things that, that, that these stories might say about God and the things that, that might happen in humanity. I mean, nothing here. I mean, nothing in the Old Testament sugar-coated. In many cases, very politically incorrect. That's what we're going to run into here. One of the Jewish theologians that writes about the story of Cain and Abel points out that this is what faith is about, that that's what this story is about. It's about looking honestly and carefully at the, the challenging stories and then trusting that there's a larger story than just this story. That if we look at those little stories individually in the Old Testament, we might just forever scratch our heads and say, God doesn't make sense. And this is what I was talking about last week, that what we have to understand is faith 
causes you to trust that outside of the boundaries of this one little story, this nuclear story, there is meaning and meaning that maybe you don't see just in this story alone, but there is a plan and a plan that maybe you don't see in this story alone, but there is a God that I do not understand who knows the whole thing. A God who is completely sovereign and a God who does and will make sense of it all. That Jewish writer that I mentioned earlier who said that he doesn't have the advantage of having Jesus in his Bible, so he said he has to grapple with the God of the, the Hebrew Bible, he went on to say, you know, the God of the New Testament is a Hellenistic, nice, good guy kind of God. But if you only have a good guy, it isn't going to be helpful and it's not true to reality. And yet, to only have the Old Testament God that appears to be a whimsical, arbitrary picture of God, it's not going to help either. We must have a very, very complicated picture of God. And that, friends, is a good thing. That's a good thing. I mean, if, if, if God is the creator of the entire universe, then at least give him some credit for being complicated. He's not simple. I mean, that's, you know, does God seem extremely complicated to you at times? I mean, doesn't, I mean, doesn't, I mean, don't, don't you sometimes go, what is going on? I just want to say to that, good, good. God is indeed complicated. He is complex. I mean, loving, just, merciful, angry, gracious, and true, but not simple. That's not the God that we serve, not manageable. He is a God to be reckoned with. He is a God to be taken seriously, worshiped and adored. He's a God who knows how to balance perfectly justice with mercy, guilt with grace, and he does it with perfection. He's a God who can be trusted to do what is right. Always, he is right. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the way that you reveal yourself to us in these Old Testament scriptures. The way that you reveal more pieces of your character and your nature in ways that maybe we, um, we wouldn't know if we only looked at the New Testament. That we need to take everything into its complete context and see that you all along have been a God of mercy that you are a God that, that, that is absolutely just and absolutely full of grace and desiring for reconciliation, desiring that we would indeed do the right thing. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you told Cain that he has it within him to do the right thing, that you gave him a second chance. And the reason I'm so thankful for that is because it's very possible and likely that there are people here this morning that are in need of those same words that there's a person here this morning that's in need of a second chance. They've screwed up and they know it. And they feel like that they are at a point of no return. And yet, your voice calls to them in the same way that you called to Cain. And you say, if, if you do right, will you not be accepted also? And Lord, sometimes that's so hard to understand because we know that the righteousness that we have is not something that we attain on our own, it's that doing right and being morally good isn't what saves us, it isn't what makes us acceptable in your sight, it's Jesus Christ and it's only his righteousness that's been given to us that makes us righteous. But yet we still see in this story and like in the book of James in the New Testament that you do desire for us to do right, to make right choices and that we do have it within us to do. We have it within us to rule over the sin that is wanting to devour us every day. And so Lord, this morning, maybe there are some that need to confess sin just to you as they come and take communion. May they just feel that conviction and confess it to you and be rid of it here and walk away from this place committed to doing right, 
I don't know what it is that your Holy Spirit wants to do from this story today, but I trust that you will as we respond in worship. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.